Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, it's nice to see you all here. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here as we open your word uh, to receive light for our feet. We're so thankful for your blessings and the way that you work upon our hearts. We know, Lord, that uh, each of us has our own experience and difficulties that we face. And so we pray for one another. We ask, Lord, that um, we can encourage one another in our study and our prayers. And we pray for those that are searching for truth, that you can lead and guide them. Help us, Lord, not to be disappointed in this world, but to recognize your providence and leading. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, morning. And um, so yesterday, I... I had a suggestion regarding how to interpret uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 to 21. And what we noticed, of course, is that there is these sections. There's three sections. Uh, the first one, you can see these paragraph markings, we'll call them. Can't remember the technical name for that. Dealing with the sons of Belial, right? And that's going to cover all the way up uh, to verse 17. And there's a whole bunch of... Spirit of Prophecy quotes in our document, and that's going to bring us to verse 18. You can see there's another paragraph marking. So verse 18 and 19 address um, this uh, linen ephod that Samuel's mother makes for him, and she's going to bring it uh, every year when she comes up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And then um, in verse 20 and 21, we again have a paragraph marking that marks that section. And this is going to be the blessing that uh, Eli gives upon Elkanah and his wife. And since they had loaned Samuel to the Lord, the Lord is going to bless Hannah. He's going to visit her. She's going to conceive and bear three sons and two daughters. So I'm sure there's not just one birth. I'm sure that's five separate births. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. So we're saying that these three sections mark uh, way marks in our history. Uh, the first, and I'll just show you here on this, how I've done this. I got up at two in the morning, so I figured I'd have time to draw up this chart go for a walk and study for a bit. So uh, what you see here is um, this is, now I put December 21st, 2012. That's just, you know, 2012 could be marked. There's different events in 2012 that could have been marked, but I'm marking that one and December 25th, 2021. And partly because December 2012 is 1221, right? 12th month, 21st day. And we know 12 times 21 is 252. And um, so we're going from 2012 to 2021. Obviously, 20, so if you take 12 times 21, it's 252. It's still the same. And that's 2,391 days. Now, that period of time, if we take one tenth of that, 239 days is going to be from October 13th. To September 6, 2019, which I don't have in this chart, but it was just one of the little details I noticed. Now, you can see from October 13th to November 9th is 392 days. Yes, and 2391 also has the 391 and a half, all of the digits of that, as Iran points out. And we can see, obviously, October 13th to November 9th. If I go from no noon, October 13th, which was when I did that calculation, 10 days after uh, test presented, 10 years in the midnight cry. 10 days later, we had the midnight cry given on October 13th. And I'm going to do this calculation of 391 and a half days to midnight commencing November 9th, 2019. And then that September 23rd date in 2017, that's just um, 777 days before November 9th. I should have span there marking that. But you, if you can add 385 and 392, you would see that. 
and then uh, 1737 days i'm just counting those days um from december 21st 2012 to september 23rd 2017 so i'm saying that first samuel 2 verse 12 to 17 dealing with the sons of belial is addressing that period and and obviously december 21st is just marking this but in 2012 parminder is going to make a prediction and uh that's going to be when Tabo is living with me and uh, he, he's part of this special email group. And uh, this prediction is made. Tabo won't let me join the group. I have no idea. What What did you put there, William? That's just my telephone number. Oh, OK. I thought, you know, I was thinking a lot. Is that your, uh, you know, how many hours you've been alive or something? <laughs> Definitely not days. Anyway. So we had this this time prediction, right, that Parminder is going to make. And Jeff is going to call it fanaticism. And, and I thought that was the end of Parminder, right, in 2012. But Parminder sprouts up again in, I guess, really in 2015. Uh, if I, I'm trying to remember if that's correct. Is it 2015 or 2014? Maybe it was 2014. Anyway, he, he had made a prediction regarding Sunday Law in 2014. I can't remember when Parminder shows up on the scene again. He's going to show up at a camp meeting in Alberta, and I'm pretty sure it's 2015. Yeah, it's 2015. And then, um, and then in 2016, him, uh, Tabo, and the other guy, Marco, um, are going to be ordained as elders. And um, <clears throat> that's right. I think it's just the three. And then in 2017, they're going to begin the work of organization. And that's going to be in September of 2017. Uh, I'm, I'm there at the School of the Prophets teaching for a few weeks while that organizational meeting is going on in Romania. Is that where it is? And... Um, so it's just a little bit of background for some people there. So so what we have in this history, now I know Jacob's here and he doesn't know any of these people or what was going on, but we believe this movement was raised up in 1989 to understand the repeat of Millerite history. And as in Millerite history, things didn't always go as planned. And, and in God's providence, God established the Seventh-day Adventist Church because of what had happened with the Great Disappointment. Uh, but most people don't know any of the history, even Seventh-day Adventists, of all the things that went on. They have sketchy ideas of it. And so this movement has studied in detail that history, uh, the characters involved, but also uh, the literature that was produced and and how God led at that time. So we're repeating that history. Now, part of that history is um, there is a camp meeting, the Exeter camp meeting, in which the midnight cry is given, and that empowers the second angel's message. And that message, when it's empowered, it's a message that's presented by Samuel Snow, that gives us the October 22nd, 1844 date for the end of the prophetic periods and for their belief that Christ was going to cleanse the earth by fire on that date, uh, which of course did not occur because that's not what the Bible was showing, but they were led in that proclamation and they were, had a disappointment in this movement. Uh, now at that camp meeting at the Exeter camp meeting, there's a group called the Waterton group and they are a fanatical group. So we saw that there was fanaticism dealing with our movement. I don't know if I would take that the Waterton group particularly was Parminder's group. We could align that possibly um, with that, you know, like how we would do that. We haven't, we haven't looked at that in too much detail, but definitely there would be some connection. Now, so how much of this do I need to go through? So anyway, Parminder's group from 2012 to 2019. It's going to be in 2019 that they're going to 
be called out for what they are. Um, Parminder's group is going to take the vast majority of the movement with him. And that's a lot of the, the people in Europe and in Africa who have been following uh, this movement. Now, we had, of course, other groups that uh, split off prior to that. So there's a lot of history, a lot of detail. What we're looking at here is that we're taking these verses and we're making an application of these verses to a history within our movement. Now, when we do this, we are not saying that this is how these verses are to be understood or that that's the interpretation of these verses. There is other applications that can be made. What we have been doing is we've been looking at how these apply to us. Now, why are we looking at how these apply to us? Why, why would we take these verses in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and, you know, take verse 12 to 21 and say, this applies to our history in this movement? Why would we do that? Does it seem kind of uh, arrogant, presumptuous, uh, anything like that? We're looking to learn. We're looking to learn from the mistakes of the past. Okay, right. You know, we could read the Bible as just past history, as dead facts. Uh, but God has shown us that 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 the Bible is living, it's active, and so for us who have been studying Millerite history and looking at the parallel in Millerite history. And as we have looked at the book of Judges and saw the parallels in the book of Judges to this movement, to our personal history, we've done so because we have lessons to learn. Now, often people will look at the scriptures and, and, and we've seen this many, many times, where they're not looking for lessons for themselves to learn, directly. They, they use the scriptures as a way of, of attacking others, of proving themselves right, of you know being argumentative. They mold and manipulate the scriptures uh, to justify their own actions, their own course. And, and some people looking at this may think that that's exactly what we're doing. They may say, oh, you're just, you know, you're part of this movement and you know, you're just trying to justify, you know, all of these mistakes you made. You know, maybe they're right. Maybe that's what we're doing. But they can't just say that without taking the time to examine it. And, and we believe that we are actually looking at our own hearts, examining our own hearts. That all truth, all light that comes to us reveals to us individually that there are things that need to change and that there is mistakes that we have made. We need to know what they are. Now, one thing is we do know that God has led us in our experience and that when God leads us, he leads us on step by step down a path. And even though we don't know exactly where it, it ends up as far as like or the path that we have to go, we know where it ends up. We know what God's purpose is, but where that path is going to take us is sometimes rather surprising. So, so this movement has been involved in what we call time setting, and I am not a time setter. I, I've, I've studied enough to know that we can't predict the future, but this movement believed that it could, and we looked at that extremely seriously, and uh, we made a prediction, and that prediction did not come to pass. But prior to it failing, it was pretty clear that if it did fail, it was on a line of failed predictions. And that uh, God in still in giving that prediction was in his providence, that it was purposeful. And some people have a hard time with that. You know, they can take scriptures like, you know, if a prophet, you know, basically, you know, makes a false prediction, you know, then he's a false prophet kind of idea. But we know that... Uh, Jonah was a prophet. Was he a false prophet? No. No. He made a prediction. Did it come to pass in the time that he said it would? 
Yes. No, didn't come to pass in the time you said it would. Excuse me. In, uh, right, in 40 people. days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Was it destroyed in 40 days? But, no, but the thing that people will bring up is that Nineveh repented. Mm -hmm. Because and, the prediction was conditional. Yeah, it was conditional. And now with uh, the prediction regarding Nashville, many people repented. Now, we don't know every person's circumstance, but we do know that Nashville is going to be destroyed by a fireball. That was predicted by Ellen White a long time ago, 1905. And so Adventists know about it. What they didn't want us is want is for us to give a date for that. Now we have this date and we put those two together for, for various reasons, but that didn't happen on the date predicted. Now it could be that, um, that if we had not warned Nashville, you know, maybe that event would have occurred. We don't know, but what we do know is that, uh, we were, to give that warning and so many and then, so yeah it, it's a good good well i'll bring up october 22nd 1844 we can yeah. talk about that after but it's a good good time here to recap so many things that took place um with the warning that was given to nashville that showed that it was God in God's providence. Like that ad never would have gotten past the editor's desk, but God had his hand over it and how it happened. It, it, it never would have a full page ad like that never would have been published in the newspaper had, had the editor been at work that day, but he wasn't, or it went through an assistant editor and they were just looking at the $70,000 of, seventy thousand dollars of ad revenue and then after that 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 went around the world around the world newspapers were were repeating it and it brought world attention to it um without a penny spent and the money that that was paid for that ad was returned by the newspaper and then doubled, and then doubled with another seventy thousand dollars given to the Islamic something foundation. Yeah. And so there was a doubling. There it went around the world, and it was published in the first place. And there's a lot of other things. What other things can you think? Okay. Of well, well, well. Simply, um, this this chart here. If you look at this. Uh, chart here from December 21st, 2012 to December 25th, 2021. The center date is actually June 22nd, 2017. Now, um, June 22nd is in 2011. Jeff was given $165,000 to start the school in Arkansas. And, um, and then in 2000, on June 22nd, uh, 2014, they're going to have the first camp meeting in Arkansas after the starting of that school. And uh, the center date between June 22nd is December 21st, 2012, between those two June 22nd, 2011 and 2014. 2011 team, <laughs> 2011 and 2014. And, uh, and then um, in 2017, of course, we have the June 22nd date as the center of this structure. And then in 2020, June 22nd is when that message of the July 18, 2020 prediction goes around the world, right? So you got all these June 22nds. And we went yesterday through 622 BC. That's going to be uh, the birth of Enoch. 252 days later uh, is going to be the birth of um, Lamech. So you got Enoch. And then, of course, he's going to have Methuselah. And then, and am I doing this right? Methuselah has Lamech. And then, um, so that's going to be 65 and 187 to make the 252. And then um, so, 777 I, I, years. These are all part of this structure. What's that? Yeah. 
so those dates aren't on this chart that you're you have, no. I guess. No. So we have yeah. 622 AM, so the 622 Anno Mundi in the year of the world. Then we have 622 BC. That's going to be uh, where you're going to have uh, the Passover of um, Josiah, and that's going to be marked in Ezekiel. So I mean, a lot of these connections, they're, they're very deep and interconnected. Um, but in Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, on the fifth day of the fourth month, he's going to talk about in the 30th year. And that's the 30th year from the Passover of, of Josiah, so 622. And, and of course, we use that uh, Ezekiel to make the July 18, 2020 prediction. That's where we first get July 18, 2020. Uh, is from Ezekiel, and um, and then uh, and then 622 uh, A.D. on July 18 at sunset is when the Islamic calendar begins. So so that's going to be in the year of the Hijra. Now that's a pro proleptic proleptic. I always get that proleptic um, calendar having to do with. Uh, the fact that the calendar was made sometime later, so you, you're just using the modern calendar and counting backwards, the modern Islamic calendar, you know, not the old Islamic calendar. So the calendar didn't exist at that time. But anyway, that's when it starts, July 18 at sunset in 622 AD. And uh, so so we have this 622 as a symbol. It's June 22nd in Millerite history. That's going to be when Samuel Snow writes his Pentecost letter. It's going to be Pentecost in 1844. Of course, Samuel Snow is not aware of that. Um, so we went through some of that yesterday. So, so anyway, from June 22nd, in, you're going to have that bombing that occurred in Nashville. It's going to be 187 days on December 25th, uh, 2020. Right. So... So even though that wasn't the prediction that we made, we didn't predict, you know, somebody's going to just blow up a bomb in a in a, a camper. Uh, that's what ends up happening. Uh, uh, seven days later. Oh, wait, thank you. 187 days after July 18. No, after oh. the, the June 22nd, after the international, oh. yeah. after July 18, 187 days later, uh, the School of the Prophets is going to be sold for 18.7% uh, below the asking price. So you get the 187 there as well in the price and also the 180 right. days. Right. So there, and there's Jeff, things. And then Jeff speaks again. Jeff speaks again publicly 1,260 days after yeah. July 18. Yeah. yeah. So 1,260 days later when Jeff... Uh, uh, basically uh, says that everything that we did with July 18th and the symbolic use of numbers was error. He's going to do that 1,260 days after July 18th that he's going to speak publicly. He, de he, he denies the light behind him. Um, now, what's significant about 1,260 other than what we know? It's the What is it? Tell me. So, well, the 1260 well, years, it's half of a 2520. So you have 1260 years for paganism, 1260 years for papalism. So okay, that's the uh, what happened. At, yeah. Okay. What happened at the 1260 mark in Millerite history? Well, 1798. Right. Okay. That's the time at the end. 1798. Yeah. Right. 38 to 1798. The time of the end when the Pope is taken captive by uh, Napoleon's general Berthier on February 15th, 1798. Right. So, I mean, there's a lot of information, a lot of details. So when we're looking at this history, what we are what we are saying is that God is speaking to us to teach us things about ourselves. Now. So we could just say, well, the sons of Belial, you know, that's just Parminder and his group. But but I'm arguing that this is the movement itself, that the movement itself, there's there is this message about Samuel. Right. So we would have um, 
on this chart here, if I was going to put uh, these other verses, just hang on, I'm gonna get this mouse going. What's it doing? Oh, there it is. Okay, so I'm gonna, so I would put First Samuel verse, uh, go there, we'll go one to 11. So that's gonna be um, this history that precedes December 21st, 2012. So that's um, the prayer of Hannah. And, and we probably could include chapter one there, but we're just going to just say chapter two. Now, what we see there is uh, we see if, if we're going to take these, um, these verses to represent years. So we had done this in the book of Judges, chapter two, that each of the verses represented like Judges 2, verse 1, represented 2001. 2, verse 2, represented 2002, right? All the way up to uh, verse 23, representing 2023. And we could see that, that there was this structure in uh, those verses. And then we showed how all of the book of Judges illustrated that history, right? So we went through that in detail. It took us... Well, about a year, I think, uh, to get that done, um, maybe a bit longer, dealing with the Book of Judges. And then we did a presentation at camp meeting in 2023 on that. So we're doing the same thing here. At least, at least I'm proposing that this, this makes sense, that we can do the same. So that means verses 1 to 11 are maybe not in every verse is representing every year in detail, but it represents that period from 2001 to 2011. So what's happening in the movement from 2001 to 2011 that would be typified by Hannah's prayer? Because what, what's happening in that, in Hannah's prayer? What is it illustrating if we want to go back to Hannah's prayer? Your question again? In, in Hannah's prayer. Right. So she's she's yeah. she's praising God for when she when she brings Samuel and dedicates him. So we're saying that Hannah's prayer is going to be representing in this movement from 2001 to 2011. So what's happening in the movement in that history? 2001 to 2011. That, well, that's that's when uh, Jeff is raising up the future for America in and future news Canada joins with it in that time. It's like a, the sun being born and being raised up. Okay. Well, there's a message that's being given. That's my shot at it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Message. Yeah. There's a message that's being developed in that history and it's because of nine 11. So prior to that, we have the first angel's message. Jeff is part of that history from 1989 to 2001. Right. And that's going to be where we come to understand the basic structure of the lines and that we are repeating Millerite history. And, and there's a lot of light in that that period of time. Jeff is is traveling around presenting. Um, I mean, he presents up in Canada. Uh, he presents, you know, places in Central America and, and uh, other places around the world. Uh, there's an interest somewhat in his message. There is uh, a development of that message, but when when uh, nine eleven occurs, we're going to see really a, a further development, an explosion of that message. Right. So there is is going to be uh, all these different groups that come and, and join. You know, they're separate in they're separate organizations, but they're going to be sharing in the work of Future for America, Jeff's organization. And the message is going to be developed. Now, we know in, in 2012, Jeff is going to do uh, the, the presentations on Habakkuk's two tables. Right. So that's also going to happen in 2012. It's going to really finish in the spring of 2013. It's got uh, and, and I watched the live on Zoom or on, on YouTube when they were presented. Yeah, Kelly. And still. And still an excellent series on Millerite history and the message. Mm -hmm. yeah. Present day. Yeah. Excellent. So it's really sort of the foundation of, of that message. Now, in 2013, 
in, in 2012, 2013, in that, that period of time, if you want to put that as a year, let's say fall to fall in that period of time, we're going to end up with this, um, the understanding of the prophetic mirror. And for the first time that we're going to use a specific date, and that's going to be from Ezra 7, 9. So this movement is going to understand something about Millerite history and what happened in 457 BC for the start of the 2300 days that Adventism had missed, a detail that Adventism had missed, and that was Ezra 7, 9. Now, the Millerites had an understanding to some degree of Ezra 7, 9, but they didn't know that it, it paralleled in Millerite history. So that opens up the symbolic use of numbers. In some ways, that takes the movement out of Jeff's hands really for the first time. Like Jeff was receiving light from different places, but now the movement goes in a direction. It, it's sort of given free reign in that time. Lots of light starts flooding into the movement, and Jeff is just trying to keep up yep. with it. That, that was Emiliano that came up with uh, Ezra 7 9, was it? Yeah, he found Ezra 7 9, yeah, yeah. in 2013. And then and in the camp meeting in the summer uh, on August 31st in 2013, I'm going to do the calculation for, uh, because I I'm the one who understands the biblical calendar. That, that nobody else seems to understand it at that time. People just thought each month had 30 days. And so uh, they, they didn't really quite know what to do with it, you know, because on the biblical calendar, the months alternate 30 and 29 because it's based upon observation of the moon, which is 29, 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three and a third seconds, the average month, right? So so it's going to average. Um, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll add to that just because you're kind of humble about it, but how how many hours did you put in studying chronology? Do you think? Uh, well, at did least you 20 have a, did you have a postdoctorate degree yet? <laughs> well, I definitely would have put enough in to get a yeah a postdoctorate degree. I, I was pretty excessive in my study, you know, and I count in that um, you know there's initially like from about 2010 to 2014. I mean, I was probably studying about. Well, at least 50 hours a week. Uh, what, was that, what was that professor, professor, professor Russell or some professor that, of Dr. yours that you checked a date with? Yeah. So Dr. Russell Nelson and I went through Leviticus 26. So he is my professor in university. He was a Hebrew professor as well as Old Testament scholar. And he had his doctorate from Harvard. And he came to believe in the prophetic periods of the 2520 and the 1260s and the 2300 days, even though he still, uh, and he died shortly after that. So he died in 2014. But he had helped me on that initial part dealing with the chronology and, and was really encouraging in what I was doing. He believed I was on the right track. So that was, that was kind of cool. But yeah, a lot of work. But the thing is, it's all in God's providence, right? I mean, obviously, you have to do the work. God's not going to just give you knowledge without without study. But it can't just be like human intellect or anything like that. Right. Obviously, God has unfolded this light to this movement. Right. Otherwise, yes, I never. And even, uh, yes. And even as we were talking the other day, you and I, that that even the things that occurred in your life that at that time provided that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Do getting there, Heidi, meeting Heidi on December 21st, 2012. If I hadn't met her, I wouldn't have had as much time. I, I don't think this movement would have gone the direction that it did unless God had chosen somebody else, right? There'd have to be somebody else who did what I did. But, um, you know, it would have been different, whatever happened. But because of, you know, my particular uh, peculiarities, um, you know, God was able to use me in this way, dealing with numbers and chronology. But yeah, how that would have unfolded, you know, if, you know, ifs are big things. But for me to have that time to have to go from working 75 hours a week in a job to 15 hours a week uh, and you know, caring for my wife 
who mostly slept during that period of time, yeah, it gave me lots of time to study. Right? So that's basically what I did is I just studied all the time. Gained a little bit of weight too, because I used to exercise a lot before then. And then uh, now I was sedentary, but I kind of had to watch over Heidi. I couldn't really leave her alone for very long periods of time. So, so anyway, that's what was happening in that period, 2013, 2014. Um, but I'd already started studying, you know, quite a bit, you know, maybe 10, 15 hours a week before that. And of course, I've always studied and studied lots of this, but it, it's still in God's providence, right? I mean, obviously you have to do the work, but God was unfolding this stuff uh, to us and to the movement. So it, it wasn't something produced by me. It's something that God did. Right, which I think is extremely important to know. And of course, as we're passing through fulfilled prophecy, only then could we have seen these things. We wouldn't have seen all of this information. You know, and I, and I still wonder about it sometimes. Like, I mean, initially, I just thought all of this, you know, God was just teaching me that nobody else could really benefit from what I was doing. But the fact that the movement could benefit from this work that I was doing was encouraging, but very surprising. And of course, there was a lot of prejudice. And I remember the first presentations I did on chronology in 2014 in Arkansas, that uh, people stood up, you know, quite a number of people said, this is a waste of our time and left. So, so I found that there wasn't really a reception to dealing with numbers or mathematics or chronology. People didn't like it. You know, it's too much like I got, uh, of say, I got to say it was hard plowing, but uh, <laughs> I picked yeah. up some here and there. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah. It, yeah. But, but you're right, though. It had to be. The details are important. Mm -hmm. and, and for me personally, it was the, the, uh, the most painful thing I ever experienced was the, the mental energy that I had to put into solving some of these puzzles. Um, it was physically painful. Like it was not like just light reading. It was like taxing the mind uh, to to the utmost and and exercising that muscle so that I could do things like study for 12 hours straight of concentrated study, which, you know, probably not a good thing to do. Uh, you know, over a long period of time, you could probably have a mental breakdown, but um you know, God sort of sustained me in all of that study that I was doing. So it, it's very interesting how God unfolded all of this information. And so we've been sorting it out ever since then and finding more and more details. But what we can say is in that period, like I, I, I joined the movement in 2010. But prior to that, we had 9-11 occurred. And, and of course, the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, many of us recognized in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, we have the, is it The Last Crisis or whatever the title is of that, that uh, chapter, where it talks about the great buildings in New York and them being destroyed. You know, obviously written long before the, the, the Twin Towers were, were built. So we could, we could see that as prophetic. And so we have these two events, November 9th, 2000, or 1989 and September 11th, 2001, uh, that become these pivotal waymarks in our line and in our movement. So from 2001 to 2011, there's this development of the message, which a change is going to come about in this next section with Parminder first making that, uh, that false prediction regarding 2014, which we shouldn't say it's a false prediction because he was predicting the Sunday law, which of course was false, but uh, there was a truthfulness to it because 2014 became within the movement uh, uh, tip a typical waymark, which I'm not gonna go into right now. But then uh, Parminder uh, also rises to prominence within the movement and um, and then he gets ordained as an elder along with Tablo and Marco in 2016. And then in 2017, they start the organization of the. They want to start a new 
really a new church, which which I was opposed to. Um, now, I'm not really a part of Future for America. I'm not really part of their organization. Um, so I have no say in what's happening. And then, uh, and then so that's going to mark from 2012 to 2017. We're just going to call that period the Sons of Belial. Now, Belial means worthless. And what we can see is that the people who are who are organizing the movement are are worthless. But it's easy just to talk about them as being worthless. We have to look at ourselves, right? So so what's going on within our own hearts, what's what's going on within the movement is we can't distance ourselves from that. Right? We can't just say, oh, it's just them, right? Because this is about us. Now, there is this message of Samuel that's going to carry through this. So we still have never really dealt exactly what Samuel represents. So we have, you know, Eli, he's going to represent the organization in some way, right? Uh, we have Hannah and Penina, Penina, who are these two wives. They represent the church, right, the two classes within the movement. And that's going to be, you know, it's a it's it's something that happens prior to, you know, Hannah's prayer. But it's it's uh, foreshadowing, we could say it's foreshadowing what the message is about. Seems like 9-11 should be on that line. It is. I don't see it. It's 2012. No. Oh, oh, well, I see. Yeah, because but this line is dealing with. So this line, we're saying that these three sections represent this history from 9-11 to 2011 is Hannah's prayer. Right? OK. Right. Yeah. So we're just we're just dealing with the sons of Belial. And so it deals with a time within our movement. In which we have and and the characteristics of Hophni and Phinehas. What is the characteristics? What's their what what do their names mean? Well, Kelly, it's not really on page eleven that you have that. The section starts on page eleven. That's going to be like page thirteen, I think. But anyway, Hophni for pugilist. Yeah, Hophni is a pugilist, and Phineas. We should remember these things. <clears throat> I should, but there's so many different definitions. Serpent's mouth. Serpent's mouth. Serpent's mouth. Right. Also, so, mean, from the Egyptian, it's also the dark-skinned one. Oh, okay. Okay, so you got these. Um, well, we'll use pugilist and serpent smoke, and that is really descriptive of what happens in that period. So we see uh, people fighting for position, jealousy. Um, you're going to have uh, when Mark Bruce becomes Jeff's right. OK, that's going to be page 12. Yeah. Right hand man. You know, there's going to be these jealousies from the other groups. Um, can't think of their names. A path of the just and, and the other ones that are all just going to leave the movement uh, in 2014. And uh, then Mark Bruce is going to be. uh, uh dismissed in 2016 uh, some of his the Alabama group many of them are going to leave in 2017 um, you know we just see uh, apostasy after apostasy as time goes on and all kinds of infighting and then of course um, all of the things that happen regarding you know the jealousies towards me within the movement that Jeff is even listening to me many people are uh, spreading rumors and gossip in Jeff's ears all the time. Um, so it's kind of amazing that Jeff even ever uh, ended up listening to me at all, but he just couldn't refute what was being said. So so that's going to happen in that history. Now, And it's really weird in 2017, the fact that I ended up at the School of the Prophets, because Heidi and I were students as well as Stephen, in 2016, and I spoke at the camp meeting in 2016 in the fall. They had us fly back for that. And in 2017, they had me come and teach for three weeks. 
uh, because they had their organizational meeting and they had their semester start in September. So I went there in September, presented from September 11th to 22nd, I think it was. Uh, and then on September 23rd, I presented at Lambert Church, a presentation talking about July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. November 9th is 777 days later, and then 777 days after that is the end of that structure. So, um, so, so in 2017, that's going to mark the end of that. In 2018, we're going to have uh, the next section. So it's, it's going to talk about the sons of Belial, everything that they did. And then in verse 18 and 19, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made uh, li uh, made a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So we're going to say that that represents those two years, 2018, 2019. Now, how can we take this? If we're going to take what Samuel is and what it means that he's a child girded with a linen ephod and what it means that his mother makes him this coat and brings it to him from year to year when they come up for uh, the yearly sacrifice. And oddly, the word yearly there in Hebrew is is the day, the day of sacrifice. I don't know why they call it the yearly sacrifice in the King James. So how, how are we going to deal with that? We, we, you know, when we're just doing right now, we're just looking at this cursorily, right? We're not going into detail yet. We're going to deal with a lot more detail because there is a lot of detail here. So October 13th, 2018 to November 9th, 2019 are the, the, those two main dates. Uh, that's going to be 391 and a half days from noon, October 13th, where I do that calculation to November 9th. So how would Samuel fit into this history? What is Samuel? What does he represent? Samuel the uh, prophet reformer. Okay, well, no. No, we're not taking it that way. We're taking him as symbolizing something in our movement, not a person. I gotcha. Okay. Right. Because he doesn't symbolize the movement itself, right? He symbolizes a message. And and what is the message of uh, Samuel? The message, message of reform. Okay, well, think about the whole thing about how Samuel comes about. What What is Samuel? Just in the simplest way, what is Samuel? Prophet. Just think about his name. <laughs> Prophet? No, his name. He's a priest. Oh, his name. No. He's a priest. What does his name mean? What does Samuel his name mean? Means ask, ask of God. Ask okay, that's of God or God. I think. Right, so God. Samuel is asked of God, right? I've heard he, he, is in a, he is an answer to prayer. Okay. Right. So, so that's what this is. Now, what is the answer to prayer? What is the prayer that brings about Samuel in our history? What What are we praying for? I know you guys are shy. Leadership from on high. Okay. Well, well, I don't think that's what we we were praying for. Of a new light. Okay. What was Hannah praying for? She definitely wasn't praying for leadership on upon high. She wanted a child. Okay, what child? And she knew that only God could give her a child that she could belong to him for the rest of his life. A yeah, child to a take male child. Yeah, a man child. And like her, her, her reproach. What every Jewish woman wants, they want to have, they want to be the mother to the promised Messiah. Really, right? That's why they want a man child. Okay. So symbolically, it's representing a prayer to have Christ's character formed in us. Because that's really what we're praying for. Right? That's at least what we should be praying for. Because this isn't about, you know, predicting things. It isn't about what the sons of Belial are interested in. Because they're just interested in, they're selfish, right? They want the best of the offering for themselves. They don't care about God's sanctuary, right? They dishonor God. But but the prayer that's being prayed, 
prayed, the prayer of Hannah, is to have Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people, for us to be transformed in character. And that's what that message is. Now, often Seventh-day Adventists, they talk about righteousness by faith as the third angel's message in verity. They misunderstand that statement because they, they don't understand the first, second, first and second angel's messages, that they are also righteousness by faith. The first angel's message is called the everlasting gospel. Um, so they just think, you know, we preach the message of righteousness by faith. But righteousness by faith in verity is when it's worked out in the life. Christ's character perfectly pre reproduced in his people is the third angel's message. The third angel's message empowered. And in all of our lines, the third angel's message is never empowered. The third angel's message arrives, and it's, there's always a failure afterwards. In our history, it's the first time that that message will be fulfilled. Okay, so, so the message of Samuel is the everlasting gospel. But the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And, and this movement knows that, but yet it's not taking it seriously. Yeah, Jeff, you have a comment? I just saw you light up. It could be just you made some noise. No. Okay. So, so how does God give us a message to this movement to correct us, to form Christ's character in us? What is he going to do? In 2012, we're going to have the first message in this context, even though this is all really about the second angel's message, as we can see, it still can break down into three steps, and we have these three steps. So what is God going to do in, in bringing about this message? How, how does that work? How does this movement function as a demonstration of the everlasting gospel? Restate your question. Okay. Please. How does how does this movement, this history that we're looking at, how is this a demonstration of the everlasting gospel? How does it how does it illustrate that that history? Not what is having Christ formed within us? We have to die to self. Okay, well that that's that's the message. But we're how is all this light. how is that we're illustrated not. by these Okay, how's that illustrated by these dates, by this chronology, this line that we've drawn out? Yeah, that's right. Because we're having to use these dates to show us our past failures, our weakness in relying so much upon the wisdom and the strength of man and not upon the wisdom and strength of Christ. Okay, yeah. So now... In 2012, yeah, okay, so Angela, you have something to say? You said something? Well, I don't know where this first is from, but one thing that just came to me was I, the lines have fallen onto me in pleasant places, and I thought, well, how pleasant is my mind, my soul, for these lines to fall on? Well, the Lord just cleanses people as they receive the light, as they apply it to their own lives, and hopefully it's changing all of us for the better. Okay. okay. Now, but there are some very practical things that we can see. So first, in 2012, Parminder is going to come with a message of time. Now, that message is going to be called Fanaticism by Jeff, right? Now, in 2012, we have a, a time prophecy based on the Mayan calendar. That's, of course, a false prediction. Right? Mayan calendar is not even actually pointing to that date as the end of the world. It's just, you know. But we, we could call this a, a new age uh, time failed prediction, right, time prophecy. But on that date, it's going to become symbolic, right? It's 13 back tunes to that date where it's actually 20 back tunes would be the complete cycle, not 13. And, um, you know, it's from the start of August 11th, uh, 31, 13, uh, 
like minus 3113 on the Gregorian calendar, we're going to have this 1,872,000 days to that December 21st, 2012 date. I'm not going to go into all the detail of it, but the point is it becomes a symbol of time that this movement is going to be involved in. So Parminder makes a prediction back in the spring of, of, of 2012 about the Sunday law being in 2014. It's called fanaticism. But we also have time show up in this movement. And that's where, where we see this happening. Now, and we're going to look at more detail in this, but God is giving us time in counter to to counteract the false message that's being proclaimed within this movement. So there is a true use of time and there is a false use of time. And, and of course, we don't know at that time how that's going to unfold. But when uh, Parminder and Tess make that prediction regarding November 9th, 2019, which is a false prediction again, just as September 23rd, 2017 was a false prediction uh, made by uh, the Protestants who believed that the secret rapture was going to happen on that date. Uh, this movement makes a false prediction, November 9th, 2019. Yet it's going to be witnessed to by God that it's purposeful. And, and we parallel November 9th with the first disappointment, right? April 19th, 1844, the end of Miller's predictions. And then, and then we're going to have July 18th, which isn't on this line. I could have put it in there, but I didn't. Uh, we will uh, deal with that. Um, but that's going to be given as a witness against Parminder's movement. Parminder is going to reject July 18th. November 9th is going to come and go. Nothing happens that he expects, but we already predict what's going to happen. And then uh, it's kind of interesting there, Angela. We quote from Psalm 16, verse 6. Okay. So then, uh, so, so what's, so we have this first part, this second part, 18 and 19, we're going to say is this linen ephod. So how does, how does that illustrate? So we're going to say the sons of Belial, that's all that infighting. It's Hoph, Hophni and Phineas, the pugilist and the serpent's mouth. There's lots of, bad things that happen in that history. So now we get to 2018 and we have a linen ephod on this message. It's put on this message. So uh, the mother is going to bring it every year. So what's being symbolized there? Growth and character. Okay. You need to be more, more detailed. Like those are too broad. Those are too, more specific, what is happening with that message? I mean, I understand what you're saying, but who's the mother that's bringing this linen ephod? The movement. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say it's the movement, though it definitely is the Seventh-day Adventist uh, movement, if we're going to put it that way. These are the truths of Adventism that are being applied. We could go back even to Millerite history. Okay. So we have had a foundation that has been laid. So one of the things, when, when we deal with this history of, of what happens, you know, from 2007 to 2019, is we're going to have a detailed understanding of Millerite history. Samuel Snow's letters are going to come into play. Because remember, we're going to have uh, a replica of the dates of Samuel Snow's letters are going to under, unfold as the same spans of time in in this movement, right? Right. We have that 126 days and all that stuff that that we didn't notice before, right? So we 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 look at Samuel Snow's letters, we notice the one chiasm, but then when we when we start to look at it in more detail, we start to see that that these are parallel structures to the day which is pretty amazing. I mean, it's just astronomically impossible that, that these dates that unfolded, that we had no idea to connect it to Samuel Snow's letters, uh, that later we find that they do, right? 
So we have this mother, the ephod. So what is this linen ephod? It does rep represent character. What kind of character? How does it represent character? What is it? Yeah, so, so one is, if you go back to Gideon's ephod, Gideon's ephod is, is going to be made out of gold that they got from uh, all of those, those moons from the camel's necks and et cetera, right? So could we contrast the two? Well, I would think that we could contrast the two because Gideon's ephod is more like the uh, reliance that has been placed on man versus that which is placed on God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we could see that, you know, after July 18th, there's still people who are going to take that Gideon's ephod and worship it. That is, they're going to use dates and numbers and symbols, but they're going to misuse them. And so, so we know that God has given this message for a specific reason, and it is to rebuke us, not to justify us. We have the, the 300 yeah. symbol at the time of Gideon. So that just happens uh, around that time, just after the, the ephod occurs. It's created just after that. Yeah. And then with uh, Samuel, it's a wee bit later than this year, but you have a 300 year time period of the okay. being shut up. Okay, yeah, so you got connected with 300, you have an e two ephods. One is a linen one in this story here of Samuel, the other one's uh, Gideon's ephod, right? They're both connected to 300, right, as a symbol, right? That's what you're saying. Right. So we can see that there is a true and there's a false. There's always a true and always a false. But the true produces yes. Christ-like character. Yeah, Kelly? Yeah, um, the uh, the one thing personally that the July 18th prediction did for me was I knew I wasn't ready. Like I just knew that if that prediction came true, and I was I was sharing it far and wide um, mm -hmm. with a conviction, and I put my money where my mouth was, et cetera, you know, donating to the ad and so on, but. I just knew that I personally wasn't ready and and I just knew it. I wasn't ready. So I, I guess one of the things that that prediction did as well is it caused us to search our hearts uh, to have that experience of the Millerites. Some took it more serious than others in, in searching their hearts. If that were to happen, I mean, if it had happened, we would have been thrust onto the world stage like never before and I totally wasn't prepared to defend my faith in in that way. Um, I didn't have the experience of Christ. You know, I just, lately it's been more real than ever before for me to what it is to die to self and to have that experience of Isaiah being humbled in the dust and woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips and all that goes with that. But that experience in July 18th, 2020 that wasn't my experience at the time I, I was I was not there so anyway that it caused me to know my con condition more than before yeah so and and we can see that that's the purpose of this message of Samuel this linen ephod representing a purity of character that is to be developed right and 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 this is in contrast uh, to what is is happening within the movement right now we're going to see of course people take up uh, you know dates within the movement after July 18th we have lots of people predicting all kinds of things some parallels Millerite history where you had people still predicting dates and and we saw clearly that uh, that even though we have dates you know, we have dates in the future that, that they're symbolic, that we're not, we don't predict events, we're just part of a structure. So, yeah, and, and of course, I wasn't really disappointed. I, I was fairly happy that nothing happened to Nashville on that date. Uh, 
for good reasons and selfish reasons. You know, the good reason, of course, is uh, you know we don't want to see you know people dying. Uh, the selfish one, though, is I didn't want to. I didn't want to be in that position of uh, of of having to bear that responsibility because I, I one is I just didn't believe I was ready for it, but also I, I don't really like. Amen. So that's kind of uh, amen to amen to both amen to both of those things. Yeah, I don't like responsibility. But I, can, some... I concur. <laughs> yeah, I'm always responsible for everything that goes wrong. But anyway, yeah. So, so we can see that 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 ephod and and the mother. This this would refer to uh, God's church has given. We've been given this inheritance, so to speak, of truth. That comes from this message from being a Seventh Day Adventist. And most Adventists have no idea about their heritage. They they can't wear it wear that linen ephod, right? We're speaking, of course, symbolically, not literally, right? Because they don't believe that Christ can can transform our characters. And so we just kind of play church and go about, you know, being Seventh Day Adventists, sort of, you know, once a week at least. Or at least for a few hours a week, right? Even if you fully, under, fully understand the character uh, development. If we knew what what God had given this church, right? But it's it's been withheld from us, our, our heritage, right? Our inheritance. So most Adventists are yeah, but I, about the past. I've, I've Theodore, I've always believed that the part I had trouble with was me. Like, I just couldn't see how it could ever be because of me. So I believe Christ can do it. It's just me getting out of the way. Yeah. I've always believed it. Yeah. Well, me too. Because that's what I've always wanted is to be like Christ. But, but God is, you know, God has his ways of transforming our characters, right? So he doesn't just, you know, wave his magic wand and, you know, we're these wonderful, perfect people. He brings us through an experience, uh, through trials, uh, to teach us. And so that's what I believe that this, this message of Samuel represents. It's, it's some, it's what's being asked of us. But we're going to see that the sons of Belial, I mean, they're going to be there even at the time, you know, when Hannah, goes to the temple and prays and um but they, they there's so much misrepresentation of the truth and, and the, we see that. Ex- the illustration i really like for that process and it is a process is uh the smelter with the gold and how how god puts uh the gold of our faith in the smelter and it heats it up and the dross rises to the top in trials of life and he skims off the dross and he heats it again and he heats it again what is it seven times hotter perhaps yeah, purified. and purified yeah, seven. purified yeah. purified seven times and, and that's a process that's not easy but necessary and the coolest part of that illustration is that he knows when the gold is pure, when he can see his own reflection in it. Yeah. And that's that's Christ reflecting well, us. Yeah, I've never done that with gold. I have done it with lead, though. When I was at uh, Silver Hills, we had to pour some Babbitt bearings, and that was pretty cool. Well, it was actually very hot, but you know what I mean. Okay, so then we have this, the next part. So, you know, we, we still... There's going to be so much detail here once we get into this. Oh, just one thing I wanted to point out about uh, um, the word ephod. So uh, what you have there is 646 is the Hebrew number. Does anybody know the significance of 646? There you got the Hebrew number for ephod. Um, You can see it there. 646 at the end of verse 18. Hebrew 646. So what's 646? Well, you could say it 46, 44 chromosomes. I mean, 46 chromosomes. Okay. 
Well, that's not the, well, yeah. Or, just, um, I think I know. I think I know. <laughs> okay. Let me take a shot at it. Four four times six four times, times four. Six, four. No. 144. No. It, it is 144, right? So 12 times yeah. four, 48. Or 36, 36 times four is, yeah, you're right, 144. Okay. So I never noticed that one. <laughs> But that's probably the best one. Uh, all I know is that when you go from uh, July 27th, 1299, and you go to the bombing of Hiroshima to July 27th, it's going to be 646 years. But on the Islamic calendar, it's 666 years. So on our calendar, it's 646, right, from 1299, right? Yeah. 646 to 1299, you get 1945, right? So from the start of the second woe to Hiroshima, but it's also 666 years on the Islamic calendar. Just uh, an interesting detail there. But yeah, that is 144,000. That's probably better. 144, six times four times six. Yeah. Yeah, I think Angela and I, we get the math award for this uh, study today. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, no, the IFAD and the 144,000, that, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, see, I, I should have noticed that one. I always notice the less obvious ones. And it's interesting that that uh, occurs in the King James 40 time, 49 times, which is 7 times 7. Kind of interesting there, too. Okay. So, and then when we deal with 20 and 21, obviously we're dealing with the dates of July 18, 2020. That's going to happen in 2020. I'll, I'll end up putting this on the chart. Um, but this is where Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, the Lord give the seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home. Okay, so so can we connect that to July 18th, 2020, as uh, Eli blessing his wife? How how would that apply? Eli blessing Elkanah and his wife, and we're gonna we're gonna have that blessing fulfilled December 21st, uh, or December 25th, 2021, right in in 2021. The end of that structure. The Lord visited Hannah. She conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. So what is, what is, if we're going to follow through, what is this all representing? Hosea 6.3, following on, on to know the Lord. There was a faithful few. Okay, you guys always are doing it. You did decide to study each day. In practical terms within the movement, what occurred? that we can connect to these two verses, not I just in a broad way. Like more practical terms. Yeah, well, more because you, we were to, you, you particularly invited all of us up here in the present truth movement to study together mm -hmm. daily, and only a few responded, and we're still continuing that, a very few of us. Okay, so... So there is three sons and two daughters that are then being produced. So what would that mean? So one is we have one son, Samuel, right? And we have three other sons. So that's a three-one combination for the sons. Now, can we say that these three, three sons also represent three messages or three way marks? That's possible. So that's possible, right? Three-step testing prophetic message. What about the two daughters? We don't know anything about them, but except that they're two and they're female. Two groups. Okay, two groups. Two classes of, two classes of worshipers. Yeah, well, here, though, you know, this is something that producers message that are, are, both, are both good, right? I mean, I don't think... I mean, usually I would look at it as two classes, but we don't have like a good daughter and a bad daughter or anything that we can see here. 
Two churches, second angel's message. Okay, this two churches, second angel's message. Okay. Yeah, and there's and lots is, of, what's that? So there's five here plus Samuel. Is that why you're taking that? You're, you're not saying, could not one of them sons include Samuel? No, there's three more sons and Samuel. Right, so she gets uh, three sons and two daughters to replace Samuel that she lent to the Lord. Okay, so you have in Ezekiel 9, is it the writers, six men? I suppose that's one with the writer's ink on. But, uh, yeah, yeah, there's six. So there's six. Men the then there's two women here, so I don't know, if, probably wouldn't make that connection. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so there's six. Well, the six are included. One of the six has the ink horn. So there is six there and there's six here. So I'm not really sure. I mean, at this point, I, I, I think that it would represent, the three sons to me would represent messages. Uh, the two daughters would represent a doubling of the movement. But but that's that's in 2021. So that that we have that symbol. Right, being presented. So, not really sure what that would mean at this point. So we, we have to we have to think about that. But the child Samuel grew before the Lord. So we're going to see that Samuel, whatever that that message is, that it's going to expand. And and then we're gonna we're gonna have to. There's there's a bunch of. So we did that one thing with the ephod as far as a symbol. But there are there Hebrew numbers here that we can look at as spans of time. Um, so we're gonna it's gonna take a little bit of work. Like I don't think we're gonna get through this very quickly. But can we see that this idea of of what I'm proposing that it it makes sense that it, it doesn't seem completely off the wall to take this and put these verses here, 2 Samuel chapter 2, or 1 Samuel chapter 2, pardon me. Um, well, it's, a good, it's a good start. Yeah, and, and it definitely illustrates, I believe, what happened with this movement. And again, it's not the only application that could be made of this history, but, but it's the application that comes to us at this time in examining ourselves. And then we need to know, because the reason God is giving us this light is because we need light for our feet as we continue to walk to follow God. What is our responsibility? What is it that we are supposed to do? You know, with this knowledge that God has given us. And, you know, we've been waiting on God. We've been studying and 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 asking God for this what, what is it he wants us to do? Now, of course, that's going to be when we get to Samuel and, and himself and we examine that again. What we're going to find is that this, these stories are going to keep repeating and adding more and more deep to what we already have. Right. So that the purpose of 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 going over this ground again and again, God brings us over the same ground uh, in our lives personally and also in Scripture. Uh to, to to show us where we are and where we need to go. So this is God leading us individually. He's leading us as a group. And other people looking on, you know, we put this out on YouTube, and, and I'm sure people watch these videos and just think it's a bunch of nonsense because they don't know our experience. They don't understand where we're coming from. But I put it there because there are people who come along and watch these videos and – um, and God leads those those people individually. We don't have to have control over what they're doing or thinking. God can lead people on his own. Um, if we represent Christ, he can use us, but he's, he's still the one leading that person. Okay, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Yeah, the ephod, uh, Ephesians 6.14, loins gird about with truth, and ephod is a girdle, right? So... So it's usually like covering, you know, more than just a, a belt. But okay, because in this case it's a like a coat. Okay, any no final thoughts?
Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have had here this morning. And just pray for a blessing for each person today. We look forward to what you have planned for us. Help us to, to listen to your voice, to follow where you lead, and to be obedient in the little things that you've given us to do each day and to entrust everything in your care. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.